Hello everybody and welcome back to Victoria 3 with this explosive French gameplay in the background. Today we're talking about the new features coming to Victoria 3's first DLC pack, Voice of the People. In particular we're looking at France, some reworks to the map for countries like France of course and French Algeria. We'll also hear about uh, some events, some flavour stuff like the Paris Commune and coups. Apparently one of the most anticipated features coming to the Immersion Pack, so we'll start with that. The Voice of the People pack will introduce a new journal entry in the game that allows unhappy government interest groups to seize power for themselves and institute a new mode of rule. A coup can begin when one of your ruling interest groups is powerful, has negative approval, and opposes your democracy. Or if the ideological foundations of the government don't quite fit very well with them. Under those circumstances, the interest group will typically begin plotting their coup within just a couple of months, so it happens relatively quickly. And as the player, we can choose to support the coup or resist it. So we have a little bit of sort of customization play options here. You don't have to fight against it. You can absolutely choose to lift up the voice of the people. The coup process itself will take several in-game months, and you'll be able to track it through a journal entry. The instigators of the coup remain powerful and angry, the progress bar continues to advance. But if you can find a way to appease them, weaken them, maybe get rid of them, then the progress bar will deplete. The coup will simply fizzle out if the progress bar completely goes away, or if the interest group no longer supports their cause. Uh, the plot will also be put to an abrupt end if you decide to eject the potential traders from government, as we discussed in the last update perhaps with something like exile. Uh, or you could simply remove the party. Uh, doing so will immediately cause them to greatly reduce their approval of you, go figure, which means you'll now have a revolution on your hand. Of course, the coups and the revolutions working in a slightly different way. The coups themselves aren't just this one-off thing that you track in a progress bar though, thankfully. They've also added story and flavour around it too, of course by means of in-game events. When a coup is ongoing, events related to it will intermittently appear, allowing a player a chance to either speed along the destruction of their current government or try and save it. The example they show is a coup event in San Salvador, an interest group successfully cooing the government will lead to their leader becoming the new ruler of the country. Here in Central America, they've just occupied a new, much less amicable president. Occupied? I mean acquired. <laughs> occupied, acquired, these are all coup words. So what happens when the coup actually takes place? It's kind of interesting. If the instigators remain powerful and angry for long enough, they'll be able to execute the coup against the government and institute their desired laws. The laws can vary, of course, depending on who they are and what they want, but the default for a coup will be to install an autocracy with the coupists. <laughs> I didn't know that was a word. Greatly favoured. However, ideological coups are also possible and are generally related to governance principles with a powerful monarch interest group within the government being able to launch a coup for a monarchy, or powerful republicans doing the opposite to a monarchical government. A coup to change governance principles will by default instate the oligarchy or the single party state laws as appropriate, rather than an oligarchy, so uh, or autocracy I should say. So it's important to note that depending on their ideological stance, what they think, what values they support and don't, will depend on the outcome of the coup. By default, it will be to install an autocracy, but there are other new things like the oligarchy, like the single party state laws that are being added for free in patch 1.3. Now for some flavor elements, some historical elements building in some extra spice into France. The French borders. The idea that the French border ought to extend significantly east was a popular one among nationalists of this era. After you research nationalism and have a suitably jingoistic interest group in government, you'll be presented with the option to pursue just such a border, rapid expansion. Uh, if this seems like a sensible idea, you'll be offered claims on the relevant state regions, but suffer a penalty to infamy. Your eastern neighbours, notably Prussia, are not likely to appreciate this clear sign of aggression. Go figure. 
Uh, there are lots of sort of different stories, events, and elements added in here that will give you claims on certain territories, uh, claims on Flanders, the Rhineland, Savoy, for example. Uh, these claims are also pretty handy, but you will suffer, like they say, an infamy decay up to 20 years at a minus 33% for pursuing your natural borders. Don't look at my gameplay as an example, because apparently your southward expansion need not be won by hostile force. The Treaty of Turin decision is available to France if they are able to secure strong relations and an obligation from the owner of Savoy. You might, for instance, benevolently help out Sardinia in their quest to unify Italy or expel the Austrians. If this country happens to also own Nice, they'll throw that in as part of the bargain. Nice. This is what success looks like if you achieve France's natural borders in this update. The map of the region looking a bit more blue. Uh, here you get a further look at some of the changes they've also made to state regions in France, uh, but you'll also note that in order to achieve a truly aesthetic France, they've split up the North Rhine so the border matches the river. And since they're on the topic of setup changes, they've also noted that they've added two new cultures to the region. Uh, some more diversity at play. The next section they say moves on to covering a selection of new content included in 1.3 and Voice of the People. 1.3 being the free update, Voice of the People being the expansion. The new pack, as we've already discussed, focuses on France, but also contains content which can apply to other regions. Much of what we're about to talk about is apparently more mechanically complex content, creating scenarios that they've tried to make smooth uh, and also offer a unique experience. We're going to be talking about the Paris Commune, for example, uh, and a few other reworks as well, including an epidemic and all sorts, a minor crisis for Europe, which requires the use of several interlocking game systems to resolve. So let's take a look at some of these new flavour elements that are being added in to a reworked France. We'll also take a look at the new Algeria, which has been uh, divided up quite a bit. Looks like it could be an interesting place to play around. The Voice of the People Immersion Pack, that paid DLC, will allow for a player, a French player particularly, to experience a moment the French Commune. Socialism and anarchism are needed before you can jump into the socialist movement. If sufficiently beaten and destabilised, a revolution in France will unleash a tidal wave of proletarian anger in the city of Paris, leading to a major crisis that will threaten your nation. When the Paris Commune exists, the player will be able to influence both the workings of the Commune and the responses of the Versailles government, moulding the crisis soon to come as they wish. A player who's controlling a reactionary France might wish to, of course, repress and sabotage the Commune in order to see through a successful occupation of Paris, whilst a player who wishes to side with the Commune, with the socialist revolution, uh, may embolden it as much as possible. So the National Guard may march on Versailles and seize power with minimum bloodshed. Advancing the bar as much as possible will allow the latter outcome, while letting the bar reduce to nothing, that progress bar that will be associated with the Paris Commune event, will lead to the former, as was historical. They go on to talk about how the Commune, when it starts, is not entirely as mature as it might feel, and that as we play through it, whether you're supporting it or not, you'll notice a wide range of characters, new historical characters, of course, that are being added in, potentially as agitators, who knows. And they also go on to say that there's plenty of events around it as well, so it's not just the fighting, but also the politicking and the decision making around that. If you end up in a weird space where the Paris Commune has endured for a long time, long enough for a, a normal revolution to break out, but you haven't completed the progress substantially enough, 100%, to carry out an uncontested march on Versailles, then the leaders of the Commune will be able to seize control of an uprising, granting Paris to the revolutionaries and allowing it to create a new France through a conventional civil war. If the outcome arises, you and I as players may either continue to play as French central government or switch to the Paris Commune and decide the future of France on the battlefield. While the events are written primarily for France, many of them also have generic variants that'll be available for any other country that fits conditions. And of course, this is being included inside of the free update as well. So don't forget, there'll be plenty of opportunity to try out these 16 new events. 
And then we have the Pabrine epidemic. In the mid to late 19th century, an epidemic of silkworm disease spread through Europe, devastating French and Italian silk industries. The identification of the cause of the disease was the work of Louis Pasteur and a notable early application of the newly developed germ theory. In Voice of the People, the paid immersion pack, there'll be an epidemic storyline, a journal entry for various European nations similar to the Spanish flu one. The disease will spread through Europe, across borders, through markets, devastating silk and kicking off tensions between workers and owners of plantations. Successfully curing the disease through the power of science will serve a great bonus to your national prestige. Now let's talk about Algeria. With the old regency shattered by the initial French invasion six years prior, in 1836 Algeria is a land of chaos. Say goodbye to the old unified Algeria of this gameplay and pre-patch 1.3 and say hello to the mess of a political setup featuring nations such as the Emirate of Mascara, uh, the Berber Kingdom, Ait Abbas and the Beylik of Constantine. Wow, that is, I didn't get through that very well, I'm not going to lie, but looks like some cool changes to the map. You can see a couple of little, of course, French territories above Mascara there as well. One or two of them remaining on the map where previously, of course, France would have controlled that entire coastline. Oh, a little one by Constantine too. And you'll also see, like France, that Algeria has received a state region makeover as well, with the old regions lacking in any real roots in historical administrative decisions gone, replaced by newer ones that reflect, of course, uh, broadly, but not exactly, the rework of Algeria itself. And finally, in the last section, I'll cover these things relatively quickly, of course I'll have the source linked below, uh, there are a few more events that were either really important to French society and development or more broadly, but of course it's got a strong French theme. Uh, in 1.3, the update, you'll get to re-experience the national trauma of the Dreyfus Affair inside of France, which apparently embittered French political life, radicalising large portions of society and exposing and amplifying deep divides that characterised society at the time. This baldy also makes an appearance, one of the most iconic characters of the 19th century, uh, coming in 1.3 as an agitator with some extra content to boot. Unsure if that's paid or free. Uh, should you find yourself fighting the good cause against enemies of liberty or enemies of Italy, there's a chance the hero of the two worlds will pop by and offer his services. The more conflicts he's been a part of, the better general he'll become. Just don't expect him to stay around for too long during peacetime, the enemies of liberty hardly rest after all. They've also replaced the French, the monarchists, the royalist ideology with three new France-specific ideologies. Orleanists, who represent the supporters of the Orleans Cadet branch of the House of Bourbon, who came to power in France in 1830 July Revolution. The Orleanists are, for the most part, supporters of a moderate to liberal constitutional monarchy. Then there's legitimists, supporters of the de Opposed main branch of the House of Orleans. Thoroughly reactionary and anti-revolutionary in nature, they are in many ways the ideological heirs of the ultra-royalists of the Bourbon Restoration. And then we have the Bonapartists. The uh, dynastic claims of the lines of Napoleon Bonaparte through his brother Louis. Historically brought to power in 1852 through the efforts of Louis Napoleon, the Bonapartists believe in a strong government capable of restoring France to its heights of glory. The ideological split will remain until one of the three factions successfully cements their hold on power. Doing so isn't easy, it will require careful manoeuvring to ensure that the faction remains on top, notoriously politically unstable France of course, where many frankly would rather just do away with all the monarchs. So we have a variety of options, including uh, some updates to French monarchy as uh, a seemingly uh, viable playstyle given everything else that's going on. And that's all today, everybody. Thank you so much for watching this Victoria 3 update. I will keep providing these as so long as you keep enjoying them. And what do you reckon about this DLC? Is it enough to make you want to buy it and play it? Have you been playing Victoria 3? Will you pick it up again to give it a go? Let me know below. I'm really keen to hear your thoughts. See you next time.